The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Bizarre Murders... Thanks, Daddy. Spoiled rich girl Paige manipulates her parents to do all her bidding. But when tragedy strikes, <laughs> Paige's thirst for revenge... That's enough! ...will have her throwing a temper tantrum... Please, open up! ...with deadly consequences. A high school senior, Paige is a straight-A student and head of the Daughter of the Lone Star State Cotillion Committee. Something doesn't seem right. The annual family portrait is something that wealthy socialite Giselle insists on, <sighs> no matter how old her daughter Paige gets. Oh, I can always count on you, Mommy. I love it. It's perfect. Okay, ladies. Let's get this family portrait done. Okay, Daddy. Giselle had trouble getting pregnant and considers her daughter a miracle. Paige, in turn, adores her mother. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> I told you that I needed the latest version of my phone, and you ignored me. Nothing's good enough for her. Giselle and her airline executive husband, Edward, are doting parents. Doting, huh? Well, that's not so secret code for parents who spoil their kids. Love them fine, but indulge their every whim, never say no, and give them a credit card? Well, don't be surprised if they turn into entitled little monsters. We're sorry, honey. Thanks, Daddy. Forgiven. Every winter, Edward takes his two favorite ladies on a lavish holiday to an exotic locale. But this year's dream vacation to Rio de Janeiro turns into a nightmare. While enjoying a goji berry body wrap, Giselle died from what doctors believe was a sudden stroke. Don't touch her. Paige's entire world has been shaken to the core. She's about to turn 18, graduate high school, and move into the adulting phase of her life. Losing her mom is coming at a very pivotal time. How that plays out is the question. Some teenagers shut down while others act out. A lot of that is going to depend on Edward. Handing over the credit card may not be enough. A few months after Giselle's death, Edward swipes right on lovecombustion.com and starts dating. Back in my day, combustion created smoke, not love. At least most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. I'm having such a good time with you. I know what you're thinking. It's fast. Am I right? Well, there's an old saying when it comes to losing a spouse, women mourn, men replace. Don't, don't blame me. I didn't make it up. I'm not saying that Edward is over losing Giselle. Just saying guys deal better with stuff, not feelings. But tell that to his daughter. Upset that her father has moved on from her mother's death so quickly, Paige does what she does best when she's angry. She gets even. Paige starts stealing from her father, staying out all night, and hanging out with a bad crowd. Where 
Have you been Paige? <laughs> what do you care? Isn't Calaire expecting you for brunch? She has nothing to do with this. Yeah, you're right. She doesn't. She's not the one who got married and forgot about it. Do not talk to me that way, young lady. You don't even seem sad that mommy's gone. What, was this your plan the whole time? So that you could live out some sick and twisted fantasy of being some swinging bachelor? You are out of line and that's enough! <laughs> Leave me alone! Ouch. Paige is taking her emotions out on Edward in more ways than one. The spoiled little girl has grown up. She used to throw tantrums to get her way. Now she throws kicks. Entitlement and anger management issues are a doozy of a combination. Paige finds comfort in the arms of Trey, her new boyfriend. They spend hours texting one another. Okay, Daddy, Trey's on his way over and I can't wait for you to meet him, so be on your best behavior for me, okay? Hey. <laughs> Yo, what's up? You're a bad influence on my daughter. That's what's up. What? She's a grown woman. Listen, you little shit. Well, hey, man. Cool it, all right? <laughs> Mommy never treated my boyfriends like this. thinking about you. <laughs> Baby, don't think about you all day. You deserve something <gasps> real nice. Yo, where did you get the coin for that? <laughs> Daddy's credit card. <laughs> Doesn't look like Paige is under her boyfriend's bad influence. It seems like she's doing fine influencing herself. Thanks, baby. It looks amazing. But when it comes to parents and their kids, nobody wants to believe the worst. And it's a whole lot easier to blame someone else, like a guy with a rap sheet, rather than your precious daughter. The next day, Edward has a peace offering. Paige, let's talk. So talk. Let's go away on a vacation to your favorite place on the beach. Remember, you had such a great time. I think we should do it again. He wants to repair their relationship and has planned a trip to an exclusive resort in the Caribbean. OK, do you insist? Just you and me. So Edward is trying to get his baby girl away from the big bad boyfriend by reverting to old times. He's hoping a holiday together will help them heal their rift. Seriously, that ship has sailed. It's over the horizon. Paige doesn't look ready to forgive and forget. Sorry, Dad, you're not very good at reading the signs. Or should I say, emojis. Paige has no plans to go away with her father and leave Trey behind. She steals Edward's credit card and books her boyfriend a first-class ticket. Paige, we're only going for a week. Oh, Daddy. You know I like to be prepared. Edward hopes a vacation will help him and his rebellious daughter, Paige, reconnect after the sudden death of her mother. He's also intent on getting Paige away from her bad boy boyfriend. I'm going out. But they've barely checked in when Paige decides to go solo. I thought we were going to spend some time together. <laughs> Daddy, don't rush me. We're meeting for lunch. Edward lets her go, but makes it clear he wants to spend some quality time with his daughter. Baby. Yo, this place is dope. You ready? Totally. Is there an emoji for uh-oh? If not, there ought to be. I can't be certain what the text message means exactly, but it's safe to say these two kids are up to something, don't you think? 
Paige has anger issues and her boyfriend has been arrested for a weapons charge. If I were Edward, I'd see Esther with one eye open. Edward has been waiting for Paige for over half an hour, and she's a no-show. What the hell is he doing here? Well, I invited him courtesy of you, Daddy Dearest. While Edward is angry that Paige stole his credit card to book Trey a flight and a hotel room, he's more furious that she purposely hijacked their much-needed father-daughter getaway. This trip was supposed to be about fixing our family. Well, he is going to be a part of our family, Daddy. Well, 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 our poor little rich girl is just full of surprises. My guess is that this spur-of-the-moment proposal at the ripe old age of 17 is Paige's way of getting back at her father for moving on so fast. And what better way than marrying a boy your father disapproves of? I hate him. I, I, I wish he died instead of her. My mother never gave me a hard time. This is all his fault. Well, I mean, we could just get married. We're getting married whether you like it or not. Absolutely out of the question. <laughs> you can't stop us. If you disobey me, Missy, and marry this hustler, you're not going to get one more cent from me. <laughs> How about a hug, Pops? Yeah, <laughs> right, buddy. Obviously, Edward's never read a parenting blog. Making threats to a teenager, especially when you're angry, is not generally a wise idea. And Paige isn't exactly good with limits. Losing her mom has made her even more volatile. I have a feeling that this ultimatum is gonna blow up in his face. How she'll retaliate is anybody's guess. The next morning, it looks like Edward hasn't managed to tear Paige and Trey apart. I need police. It's not every day when you find a suitcase stuffed with a dead body instead of dirty socks. Island police need to track down Paige and her bad news boyfriend to figure out what happened to send Edward packing for good. Police arrive at the resort to investigate Edward's murder and immediately search the hotel room. they discover an unopened bottle of bubbly. It's heavy enough to do more damage than just cause a severe hangover. And with a print left behind, they hope it leads them to the killer. It was just him and his daughter that came down together. That's right. When police try to locate his daughter Paige and her boyfriend Trey, none of the employees know their whereabouts. The Bahamian police scour the island looking for the couple. With Edward dead, it's possible Paige and Trey could also be victims. Police eventually receive the tip the couple has been spotted at a seedy motel. Police, open up! Are you Paige and Trey? Well, before I answer any questions, what business do you have barging in here? What about our privacy? On your feet. Up. As the last people to be seen with Edward, Paige and Trey are brought in for questioning. So we're trying to get to the bottom of what happened to your father, Edward. I see that you checked in together, shared a room together. When was the last time you saw him? Well, actually, it was um, right before we got engaged. <laughs> hmm? My congratulations. Thank you. When police question Paige and Trey about Edward's murder, they claim to have no idea what happened. 
They tell police they left the resort early on Friday to get married. But, uh, ran into a little trouble. Well, yeah, what kind of trouble? Well, I mean, walking down the street, and this guy comes up, he's asking us for money. There's a knife on us. <laughs> Knocked him right out of his hand. I mean, no one hurts my girl. <laughs> Rich tourists off the resort are prime pickings for local criminals, so Trey's story sounds believable. If you believe he's a quick thinking hero or just quick thinking, period. That's gonna be a stretch, especially once the police find out he has a record and his prints are in the system. Police run Trey's prints and discover they're a perfect match to the bloody fingerprint left on the champagne bottle. Even more damning is the surveillance footage from the hotel. When police put Paige in the hot seat, she plays it cool. Is that me? <laughs> the resolution could be better. It's the same suitcase. Why'd you do it? It was awful. I, I, I mean, we didn't mean for it to happen, but it, it all just happened so quickly. Paige tells police it was an accident. She says that after their argument, she placed an order with room service. Yes, uh, one bottle of your most expensive champagne, Cristal, if you have it. No, thanks. She says she was hoping her father would come around and toast their engagement. Over my dead body, are you gonna marry her? <laughs> You're such a drama queen. You want drama? I'll show you drama. You're crazy, you're creep. The next thing I know, he's lunging at me with a bottle of champagne. She tells police that her father was so angry that he completely lost control. Daddy, are you okay? <laughs> Paige claims that Trey didn't intend to kill Edward. He was just protecting her. But when they realized he was dead, they panicked because of Trey's prior criminal history. They knew it wouldn't look good on him. Once they ditched the suitcase, they took off. And if it weren't for Trey, then <sighs> who knows what would have happened. Can I have my phone back now? No emoji expert, but I'd say Paige is confident she's come clean, and it's just a matter of time before she can start planning the social event of the season, her wedding. Sorry to burst your bubble, Paige, but when it comes to a murder investigation, the cops don't call it a day after a so-called confession. Police discover upon the death of her father, Paige becomes the sole beneficiary to her mother's multi-million dollar estate. So Giselle was the one with the money in the marriage. Getting daddy out of the way would mean a lot more money for Paige and nobody to enforce her curfew. And if past behavior is any indication, what Paige wants, Paige gets. When Trey marries her, he'd also reap the ill-begotten rewards, though he'd have to put up with all of her emojis. I mean, I mean emotions going into the marriage. Is Paige a grieving teenager caught up in a family drama, or is she a stone-cold killer who planned the ultimate payback for a big payout? Police need to find proof, or she and her fiance could walk. Police retrieve Paige and Trey's deleted cell phone correspondence going back a number of months. Okay, man emoji, gun, scary skull, money bag. These are starting to make sense to me. That's scary that it does. 
but you don't have to be a millennial to figure out that these messages paint a pretty disturbing picture. They proved that Paige and Trey planned on killing Edward for the money. We have an emoji for that. It's a premeditation emoji. She really hated him, man. When the police confront Trey with the text message evidence, he breaks. I mean, she's gonna give me this huge cut of the inheritance if I took out this hit. He got played. Turns out Paige's inheritance is actually only $5 million. Now that's not peanuts, but it still falls way short of her claim and it buys her a lot fewer hair bands, that's for sure. It looks like Miss Emoji was the mastermind of this plan, but she convinced Mr. Gangsta Light to do the actual deed. And for that, I guarantee he'll be doing a long stint in a foreign prison. Trey tells police what really happened that night. After the scene in the lobby, Edward and Paige had a talk. Paige, you know, you're just too young to get married. But Daddy, I've always been mature for my age. <sighs> okay, fine, so we'll have a long engagement. All the celebs do it. Yes, hi, I'll have a bottle of your most expensive champagne. Crystal, if you have it. No, thanks. Having put their bad blood behind them temporarily, Paige tells her father that the moment deserves a champagne toast. Paige's plan was simple. Trey and Paige are both charged and convicted of Edward's murder. They're both sentenced to 15 years in prison. During the trial, Paige shows no remorse for her father's murder, but true to form, she reveals all to the media via text message with a phone she sweet-talked from a fellow inmate. Whoa, talk about emojis running high here. Uh, allow me to translate. Paige claims her motive for killing her dad was revenge. Giselle's autopsy proved she died of a stroke, but in Paige's mind, her father killed her. And when he tried to end her relationship with Trey, in her mind, he became an evil monster. And for that, she was convinced he deserved to be punished. Kids might blame their parents for their unhappiness, but Paige crossed a line. She committed patricide, which isn't as uncommon as you may want to believe. So what do you think? Entitled rich kid who snapped after her mother's death or a stone cold sociopath? If you have any thoughts, text me. But no emojis, please. On this episode of Bizarre Murders, Donna and her daughter Shayna have lived a life of hardship. Shayna's illnesses have left her wheelchair bound, and her mother has sacrificed everything to help her. But when Donna encounters evil at the hands of a stranger, and her daughter goes missing, police race against time to save them and uncover a hidden secret. In a quiet, small town, Lana is concerned about her neighbors, 46-year-old Donna, and her severely handicapped teenage daughter, Shayna. Lana is worried because bizarre messages were posted on Donna's social media page earlier that day. From an investigator's point of view, you want to pay attention to the difference in tone from the previous posts. 
Does it sound like a sweet, loving, single mother who has selflessly raised her sickly, handicapped daughter? Or does it sound more like the writings of a deranged killer? My vote is for number two. Lana drops by to see what's going on. The house looks like it's been ransacked. Now, very worried about her neighbors, she calls the police. When no one answers the door, police enter the house. Donna? Shana? He makes a horrific discovery. It appears that Donna has been bludgeoned to death. Hey, dispatch, we've got a dead body here. No murder weapon at this time. No signs of forced entry. Send back up. When you don't see any evidence of forced entry, you can often conclude that the victim knew their killer. It happens more often than we'd like to think. An unsuspecting person opens the door to their trusted friend or relative, and the murderer waltzes right in. Game over. Police do a sweep of the entire house. The good news? The killer is gone. The bad news? So is Shayna. Shayna is confined to a wheelchair and can only travel with her mother's assistance. Everything points to a kidnapping. Imagine the situation the police have on their hands. It stands to reason that the killer has taken Shayna. So somewhere out there, there's a severely disabled teenager whose chances of survival are slim. During my time with the FBI, I learned the hard way that if you don't find the victim of an abduction within the first 48 hours, it gets pretty grim, and it gets that way fast. There's a ticking clock, and it started hours ago. Police interview Donna's neighbor, Lana. She tells them that Shayna has been having a romance with a man she met online. He's really cool. He's really, really cute. He makes me laugh. He's so funny. Does your mom know? No. Oh God, she'd kill me. His name is Robbie, and he's a 32-year-old resident of Utah. Now we're getting somewhere. Whenever you've got a missing woman, the first place you look is her husband or boyfriend. 85% of the time, if they haven't done the deed themselves, then they've masterminded it. And I use the term mastermind kind of lightly. Using Robbie's social media account, where he has helpfully posted his address, the police are able to track him down to Salt Lake City, Utah. Really? Posting your address on your social media account? Oh, come on. That has to take the cake for one of the stupidest things anyone can do, much less a potential criminal who police are looking for. They've come prepared for a violent confrontation with a suspected brutal killer. Sorry, I was just in the bathroom. Come in. Who's there? Instead of finding a sickly disabled Shayna, possibly tied and bound. Shayna? The police find an able-bodied, healthy young woman. Shayna is obviously not kidnapped, nor is she disabled. Someone's got some serious explaining to do. Shayna and Robbie admit they've been having a secret long-distance love affair. The investigation has taken a bizarre and completely unexpected turn. So now the investigators have to switch lanes, throw their original assumptions out the window, and follow the breadcrumbs. And in this case, it's not a straight line. Shayna, I've got to tell you, your mother's dead. What? She was murdered. No. I'm sorry. No. What? I know it's hard, but I have to ask you if you know anything. Shayna claims to have no idea who would want to hurt her mother. Everyone loved her. Shayna, I was under the impression that you were sick, even in a wheelchair. Shayna tells an astonishing tale.
For her whole life, she has been forced by her mother to pretend to be an invalid. Sheila. Mom, I feel fine. She had none of the medical problems or illnesses Donna claimed she had. Even her age had been a lie. Most people thought Shayna was 18. In reality, she's 26. Mother-daughter relationships are complicated at the best of times, but this takes it to a whole new level. You've got a mother who has somehow made her daughter believe all of her life that she's been sick. And you thought your mom was tough on you? It's pretty much the wackiest case this cop has ever heard. Was Shayna truly a victim or a willing accomplice? Sometimes criminals hide in plain sight, which can make them even more difficult to catch. And this is especially true of fraudsters like Donna. They fit seamlessly into society. And if you show them a vulnerability, they'll play you. Who was Donna? And how did she get away with this brazen fraud for so long? Born and raised in Texas, Donna grew up with an abusive father. She had Shayna when she was only 21 years old and worked as an office cleaner to make ends meet. When Hurricane Ike hits and she loses everything, she packs up and moves north to Cheyenne, Wyoming for a fresh start. I've been taking care of her all her life. I'm her mother, and I know what's best. She needs the surgery. From the moment she was born, Donna claimed her daughter suffered from numerous ailments. She's sick. They travel from clinic to clinic, with Donna browbeating medical experts to provide the diagnosis she wants for Shayna. If one doctor doubts her claims or produces negative test results, I'm going to get a second opinion. She simply goes to another. Shayna endures many unnecessary surgeries and even has a feeding tube inserted into her stomach. This allows Donna ultimate control. She can monitor what Shayna eats and can administer whatever drug she wants her to take. Shayna, look at the beautiful colors in this book. Oh, what a cute little bird. <laughs> My goodness. He seems to be quite happy to be there, yeah. too. Oh, look at these. Donna treats Shayna as though she's many years younger than she really is. Hey, sweetheart. I like his shirt. <laughs> she withdraws her from school, telling everyone she is stuck with the mental capacity of a seven-year-old. <laughs> By the time she's a young teen, Shayna doesn't even know her true age. <laughs> Oh, sweetheart, I'm, okay. I'm not feeling well. I, I think I might need my pills. Of course, sweetheart, of course. <clears throat> Shayna is, in effect, brainwashed to believe she's an incurable invalid. So the next time you think you've got problems with your own mother, think again. Here's your check. The public eats up the story of a single mom with a severely disabled daughter. I'd just like to thank him. It's been such a difficult time for me, us, and we really appreciate all the love that, that has gone into assisting Shayna. Being a single mom is hard, but with all the help from everyone, we really appreciate it. Don't we, Shayna? Donna benefits from social assistance and donations. This woman makes Joan Crawford look like a saint. Not only is she making her daughter ill, but she's making a quick and easy buck at the same time. What no one knows is that Donna is exhibiting classic signs of a rare and highly disturbing condition. It's gonna be so helpful to us, isn't it, Shana? Munchausen syndrome by proxy, a disorder in which a spouse or a caregiver fabricates illness in their partner or child. So let me spell it out for you non-believers. Basically, your loved one isn't killing you. They're simply making you sick so that they can get attention. I would do anything for my daughter. 
It's a controversial concept and not universally accepted by mental health experts. So as an investigator, you've got to wonder, is it deliberate abuse or something that the instigator can't help? Is it a real illness or a way of rationalizing appalling behavior? In my 25 years of law enforcement, I've seen strange motives, but making your daughter believe she's dying so you can get attention? Well, that pushes the crazy meter full tilt. Shayna is forced into a life of deception until one day she makes a glorious discovery, the internet. Shayna discovers there's a whole world out there beyond the prison her mother has created for her. And she's determined to explore it. Up until now, Shayna isn't a typical teen. But deprive them of candy, and they'll want candy. Deprive them of a social life, you get the picture. Shayna becomes quickly obsessed with the new opportunities presented. Shayna sets up three secret social media accounts and communicates with people at night when Donna is asleep. And by people, I mean boys. And by boys, I mean men. Shayna's first attempt at independence takes place at a comic book convention, a rare treat from Donna for her sick daughter. Shayna takes the first chance she can get and ducks out of Donna's view. mother scorned, especially one with psychological issues. And you, you are never going to leave me. And this, you are never going to see again. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Every rational human being has their breaking point. And the moment in the hotel room is the proverbial last straw for Shayna. Donna eventually gives back the computer, figuring that Shayna has learned her lesson. But Shayna has other plans and begins plotting to escape her mother and their life of deception for good. The internet has changed the world in a lot of ways, from how we interact with each other to how we form intimate relationships. Enter Robbie. Maybe not the greatest catch in the world, but for an isolated young girl whose only means of communicating with the outside world is online, not bad. Together, they create a vivid online fantasy world. But fantasy soon crosses over to reality, and they start dreaming of a life together. There's only one thing standing in the way of her happily ever after. Mommy dearest. So you might think to yourself, why not just run away? Shayna probably thinks her mother will track her down and destroy her one chance at happiness. After a year of dating online, Shayna and Robbie finally meet IRL in real life at a movie theater. The movie can wait. They find a private spot to consummate their relationship. It's no honeymoon suite, but it'll do just fine. Let's run away together. What? Yes. I can't, my mom. No, she, she wouldn't understand. She needs to be gone for me to be with you. Shayna reveals to Robbie her big plan to permanently erase her jailkeeper, AKA her mother, from her life. And she needs Robbie's help. If I had a girlfriend and she told me on our first official date that she wanted to kill her mother, 
I'd run for the hills. But then again, love can cause people to throw caution to the wind. If I were to venture a guess, I'd say the fantasy world Shayna has created has crossed over from fantasy to delusion, and she's looking for someone to do her bidding. Let's do it. Donna sleeps like a log. Shayna sneaks out of her bedroom and quietly lets Robbie into her house. That's perfect. We gotta do this. Are you sure about this? 100%. I've never been more sure about anything. With Donna blissfully unaware, her beloved daughter prepares to cut her sleep a little short. Years of psychological abuse may give Donna cause for regret as her daughter, Shayna, executes her plan for freedom. Children killing their parents is very rare. It's even more rare for a daughter to be involved in killing her mother. But Shayna is caught in a perfect storm. She lives an isolated life, and she has an unwavering belief that there is no other way out. Once Donna is dead, Shayna takes $3,000 of her mother's money, and with Robbie, heads to his home in Salt Lake City where she's ultimately arrested. The people of Cheyenne are utterly shocked. There, on the evening news, is Shayna. Her hands are cuffed behind her back. But more shocking than the murder charge is the fact that she's walking. Although the murder appears premeditated, given the unique nature of her circumstance, Shayna is allowed to plead guilty to second-degree murder. She's sentenced to 15 years in prison. Some are convinced Shayna's intent was pure evil. Others see Shayna as a brainwashed victim who made a desperate bid to free herself from her monstrous mother. Mother-daughter relationships can be difficult to navigate, and a daughter killing her own mother can be hard to understand. But maybe Shayna inherited more from her mother than she realized when she entered this made-up fantasy world. She simply played her part in the fairy tale and rid the world of the villain. On this episode of Bizarre Murders, Dylan is living the dream. I'm killing it. He has a gorgeous condo, a beautiful fiance. I'm gonna give you the greatest wedding you've ever seen. <laughs> Dylan, I love you. <laughs> and a high-paying job at an investment firm downtown. But when his father ends up murdered in his own backyard, the cops come calling. And Dylan's dream life suddenly turns into a nightmare.
In an upper middle class suburb just outside of Boston, detectives respond to a 911 call. Hello, there's been an emergency. A young woman reports that her brother Dylan has just stabbed their father to death with an arrow. Detective O'Reilly arrives to find Dylan relaxing in his backyard. Detective O'Reilly here. Possible 1054. Victim arrow through the chest. Are you Dylan? Yes, sir. Did you do this? This kid looks like he just finished a tennis match, not like he just murdered his father in cold blood. In my 25 years as an FBI agent, I have to say I've rarely seen a bow and arrow used as a murder weapon. So I give this guy props for originality. But the real question is how does a privileged prep school kid end up stabbing his father to death with an arrow in his own backyard? The answer, one pathetic step at a time. When Dylan's mom dies in childbirth, his father single-handedly raises both he and his twin sister, Madison. Larry builds a successful real estate development business from the ground up. And as a teenager, Dylan lives a charmed life with sports cars and credit cards paid for by his father. Look, Dad, can we get a move on? I, I got a date tonight. This is important, Dylan. Things are going to change around here. When Dylan and Madison graduate from high school, Larry kicks them out of the nest. Now that you're adults, you're going to have to make it on your own, just like I did. You build some much-needed character. Look, that's fine, but how am I going to pay for my car and for my clothes? And get a job. A what? A job, loser. Like to support yourself? Everything was pretty easy for Dylan in high school. He got by on his looks, his charm, and, oh yeah, on his father's cash. Larry's now trying to teach his children the value of a buck. But the problem with pulling a silver spoon out of someone's mouth is, if they don't have the chutzpah to make it on their own, they can choke. Dad, check this out. Madison thrives when she's admitted to Harvard and receives straight A's. Dylan quickly drops out of the local community college and starts on a new plan. What a bore landscaping cup. This is a stupid name. I've already got five clients, and I'm about to sign three more. Dylan, I'm familiar with your big ideas, but can you see this one through? Yeah, for sure. So can I move back in? I just need a little time to get back on my feet. I'll be out by the end of the year. I promise. Against his better judgment, Larry relents. Only one year, then you're out. Awesome. Oh, man. But unbeknownst to his father, <laughs> instead of starting his own business, he gets a job at a movie theater so he can watch films all day long. <laughs> now that he's footing the bill instead of daddy, he falls deep into debt. After two weeks on the job, Dylan receives a credit card bill for a whopping $5,000. Then, one afternoon, the movie theater plays a matinee of the latest heist movie, and Dylan gets an idea. He decides to rob convenience stores to make some money. Wow, what a brilliant idea. Why didn't I think of that? Oh, wait, because it's illegal and stupid, that's why. This guy is living in an alternate reality if he thinks he's going to be able to pull off a robbery like they do in the movies. But illegal is stupid's middle name. Go time. Thought? Dylan starts robbing convenience stores on a regular basis. He steals $15,000 in two weeks and starts living like daddy's footing the bill again. 
Dylan begins to gain notoriety, which fuels not only his ego, but his confidence. And despite heavy surveillance of corner stores, Dylan remains one step ahead of the cops. Where are you, you miserable mind? Making fools of the detectives. I'll give him this. For a guy who doesn't want to work very hard making an honest living, Dylan's doing a pretty good job at robbing corner stores. And the fact that the media is covering him only makes him want to keep going. But the reality is, this ruse can only last so long. And when criminals get cocky, detectives get lucky. After successfully robbing over 15 corner stores, Dylan makes a small mistake and parks too close to a security camera, giving Detective O'Reilly his first real clue. He runs the plates and tracks the vehicle to Dylan. There you are, you moronic mime. But when he runs his name through the criminal database, he learns Dylan has no priors. No, Detective O'Reilly decides to put a tail on him. O'Reilly's smart to put a tail on Dylan, because all he has now is some video footage that's kind of suspicious. Any defense attorney worth their salt could argue reasonable doubt. But if O'Reilly can catch him in the act, he can wipe the smile off the mime's face and put him in the slammer for a long time. A day later, Dylan strikes again. Why didn't anybody get this? Give me the money. Mime's up, buddy. Dylan is arrested for armed robbery. But with no prior convictions, the court is lenient and sentences him to two years in prison. Two years later, Dylan is released from prison. Well, it's just been a couple days since my interview, so I wanted to call and check. He moves yeah. back home, but finds rebuilding his life isn't as easy as he thought. And, and you guys have a copy of my resume? Mm-hmm. Well, so what's the problem? His old friends want nothing to do with him, so. and his criminal record makes getting a job impossible. No, that was a long time ago, and it doesn't You know what, buddy? Screw you. Frustrated and lonely, Dylan spends most of his time alone. Until one day, he comes up with an idea. Look, Dad, I have a plan. Pulling up his bootstraps and determined to make his father proud, Dylan decides to enroll in an online course to become a trader. They're going to give me my certification. It's all legit. I just, I need the course fee. No way. Come on, Dad. I know I've let you down in the past, but I'm willing to put the work in. It's against my better judgment. I'm a new man, I promise you. Don't you dare screw this up again. Dylan tells his father he's turned over a new leaf. But sure enough, he's back to his old ways, looking for the easy way out. Dylan skips the certification process and opens up an online trading account. I'm killing it. That's the problem with kids like Dylan. They rarely change. Despite the fact that dear old dad wants to believe in his son, the truth is Dylan is a born liar will do anything to live on Easy Street. Yes. Yes. Hear that, Dad? At first, Dylan makes a killing, but he spends the money as quick as he makes it. Four years now? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I like it. It's, it's good work. Out celebrating his newfound success as a trader, he meets Layla, a beautiful real estate agent who's sweet and trusting. What do you, what do, you do? I'm a trader at a big downtown firm. You know, it's... High pressure, but 
Big rewards, right? Wow. Must mean long hours. Yeah, it's all right. Well, if you mean long hours, as in sitting in Daddy's dark basement playing on the computer for 18 hours straight, then yeah, I guess he does work long hours. I still can't believe you've never had oysters ever nope. in your life. I don't know, they're weird. No, they're not that weird. <laughs> and it's an adventure, because you gotta like get in there and get shuck it. A few months later, Layla invites Dylan to move into her expensive condo. Dylan showers Layla with extravagant gifts. I booked us a trip to the Bahamas. Uh, Dylan, you're spoiling me. Uh... <laughs> Look through it. There's another surprise, too. What else could there be? Dylan, wasting no time, pops the question. Will you make me the happiest man in the whole world? Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to give you the greatest wedding you've ever seen. It's going to be amazing. Dylan, I love you. <laughs> it seems that Dylan has put his criminal past behind him and is looking towards the future. I, I feel call your sister. Go, go. I, <laughs> Dylan proposed. Oh, my God, God. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, and I was just wondering if you'd be my maid of honor. Oh, really? Oh, they start to plan the most extravagant wedding this side of Boston. Uh, I was thinking about 350 people. I have tons of cousins on my mom's side, so. Oh, that'd be perfect. Okay, okay, I'll let them know. It seems like everything is on the right track. Dylan's making money, he's engaged to a nice girl, and his family is happy. But in reality, it's all based on lies. He's told Layla that he has a fancy schmancy job and is made of money. But in reality, he's a slacker who spends his days in his father's basement. It's not whether this loser is headed for a fall, it's a matter of when. But while Dylan keeps up the charade of working at his big wig job downtown. I love you. Love you too. Have a great day. You too. He spends his days in his father's basement, losing hundreds of thousands of dollars trading online. Dylan's basically back to square one. He's got no money, no real job, and he's racked up his credit card debt. But this time he has a lavish wedding he needs to pay for and a fiance who thinks he's loaded. He feels pressure to keep up appearances, but weaved a web of lies so complex, he's got no way out. What's that saying? Desperate times call for? Oh yeah, desperate measures, that's it. Despite the fact that Dylan promised Layla her dream wedding, he has no money to pay for it. Hello? Yeah, that's me. All right, all right, I'll pay the full balance tomorrow. As the wedding day draws closer, the creditors come knocking. Dylan, having run out of options, goes back to Daddy, hoping he'll bail him out once again. Dad, can we talk? I'm sorry, but I need help. I've just got a lot of debts, and with the wedding coming up, it's... But you're doing so well now, I don't understand. I didn't want to tell you this, but I never did my certification. I've just been trading online. You've got to be kidding me. What did you do with the money I gave you? I invested it. And? I'm $250,000 in the hole. What? Look, Dad, I'm sorry. I wanted to tell you, but things have been going so good. I wanted to tell Layla but I can't go get a new job because she doesn't know about anything, about my past, about anything. That's it. That's the last straw I'm done with you. I, I just need a, a little bit of money and then I can win it all back. Win. I mean earn. I just need a little help. Instead of money, Larry gives Dylan an ultimatum. I've got an idea. I'll cover your debt. $250,000, is that right? All you need to do is tell her the truth. Come clean about your past and how you're broke now. And if you don't tell her, I will. You can't do that, Dad. Just watch me. <clears throat> what you see here is a desperate man 
being cornered. And while Larry doesn't know it yet, he's just put one foot into the ring, and this fight isn't going to end well for one of them. With his father threatening to reveal the truth about his life to Layla, Dylan becomes more and more paranoid. Dylan, come here. I want to show you the wedding favors. I'll be right in. Backed into a corner and unwilling to tell Layla the truth, he comes up with a plan to fix his problems. I've got no other choice. He decides in order to keep the house of cards he's built from crumbling, he must get rid of the one person who can tear it down his father. OK, OK, I know what you're thinking. This is a pretty big jump. He's gone from trying to salvage his pathetic little life to deciding to kill his father. But Dylan's always taken the easy way out, and this is no different. He's essentially a narcissist who's pretty much always gotten what he wants. And if something gets in his way, he either lies or gets rid of the problem. And in this case, the problem just happens to be his father. Dylan puts his plan into motion and starts looking for a murder weapon. He can't buy a gun because of his previous conviction, so he buys a second-hand bow and arrow instead. He sneaks into his father's backyard and hides the bow and arrow. Interesting weapon choice. If you can't get a gun, why not get a bow and arrow? Really? I mean, it's true they're deadly, but mark my words, they certainly aren't user-friendly. The next morning, Dylan says goodbye to Layla as she leaves for work. Hey. I just have to send a couple emails, and I'll be right at the door. Have a great day. Me too. <laughs> then sets about building a digital alibi that will send multiple emails while he's committing the murder. It's a simple plan that leaves a digital footprint, proving he was home the whole day. I'm no computer expert. I barely know the difference between analog and digital. But according to the computer geeks at the FBI, a computer IP address creates a digital footprint that allows activity to be traced to a specific instrument at a specific location. You can create an alibi for yourself, maybe not airtight, but good enough. Dylan arrives at his father's home, hoping to convince him to keep his lies and criminal past a secret from his fiance. I know you told me that I should tell Layla, but look, I need you to promise me that you're not going to tell her. Absolutely not. If you don't tell Layla by the end of the day, I will. If you do this, Dad, you'll ruin me. Dylan, the foundation of marriage is trust. You have to stop lying. I just need a little bit more time, a little bit more time to sort everything out. You run out of chances, Dylan. It's time to face some music. No. Are you going to tell Layla or am I? Neither of us. Dylan, what the hell is that? I told you, neither of us can tell Layla. Do you need some help with that? No. Scene? I told you, neither of us. You can't tell Layla. Dylan, you can't tell that. Layla. You can't tell that. Layla. Ugh. Dylan attempts to hide his father's body when his sister, Madison, arrives home unexpectedly from college. Dylan, what are you doing? Daddy! Why would you do this? Don't tell anyone. You're insane. Don't! Hello? There's been an emergency. As Madison manages to get away and call 911, Dylan realizes the jig is up. Dylan may have had a chance to pull this thing off if his sister hadn't shown up and blown his cover. Now, he's basically toast. Cops have motive, means, opportunity, oh, and an eyewitness. Almost makes me feel kind of sorry for the guy. Not. Are you Dylan? Yes, sir. Did you do this? Dylan confesses to his father's murder and is sentenced to life in prison. Yo, can I get like a sparkling water in here? 
looks like Dylan's house on Easy Street has finally been sold. The thing is, Dylan wanted a life of luxury, but he wasn't willing to work for it. He was always looking for the path of least resistance. So when his father finally forced his hand and made him confront the truth, Dylan simply wasn't able to. In his mind, he had to keep the lie going. And if that meant killing his father and attempting to silence his sister, then so be it. The thing is, if he had used his smarts to make something of himself instead of thinking up scams for a living, he could be running a Fortune 500 company by now instead of wasting away in a jail cell. The truth hurts. On this episode of Bizarre Murders, when a beloved matriarch disappears without a trace. Now why would she leave her car here? Her family thinks something terrible has happened. But when investigators find no evidence of foul play... This could be the answer. Her brother turns to an unconventional source for help. Will the gift of second sight lead to a revelation? <gasps> or bitter disappointment? Francine, the head of a family-run maple syrup business, hasn't been seen in 24 hours. Her car has been found abandoned, but no sign of Francine. The last anyone heard, she was drinking and playing the slots at the Palais de Folie. Off to the casino, huh? Oh, well, why would she leave her car here? She'd probably had a few and called a boyfriend to pick her up before getting on the highway. It's happened before. I'll drive it back to my place. Merci, Inspector. <laughs> Francine and her family have been in the maple syrup business for generations. She's made a small fortune through hard work and keeping her people close. Her younger brother, Antoine, runs the day-to-day -day operations. Let's see what the Lavos have to say about these numbers, huh? And keeps the peace with local rivals and politicians. <laughs> Don't forget your syrup. Don't put it all on one set of pancakes, eh? Ah, yes. Robert, Francine's nephew, didn't quite inherit the family's knack for the business. <sighs> Man. Yeah. And he can't afford to lose a drop of product, despite his best efforts. Oh, his sugar bush just isn't yielding enough sap to meet Francine's strict family quota. Come on! What was that, huh? You can't even skate! <laughs> it's a raucous family, but Francine runs it like she runs her business. Come on! Come on! Come on! That goes, Toronto! Why don't you set it to get me another range, Ginger? We, we. There's no doubt about who's in charge. Hurry up, Antoine. And, yeah, hurry up. I'm coming. It may look all joie de vivre, but you don't need to be a cop to know that every family has simmering tensions below the surface. You see, Francine is head of the family and boss of the family business. They all depend on her for their jobs. And Francine's a tough coach. You didn't bring in your syrup quota? Penalty. Get lippy or out of line? Benched. Maybe for good. What are you doing, love? Oh, come on, man! So everyone's just a little bit afraid of old Francine. Francine works hard, but she plays just as hard. She's famous for having a good time. Her week-long benders are legendary. A blur of rye, men, Any luck? and money. Inspector! 
Inspector. Francine has now been gone for three days, and her brother Antoine thinks something's wrong. You know Francine, huh? The night her car was found, she was supposed to meet him for some poutine and business talk. I wait there for hours, she not show up. I've been calling her for three days now. She no answer, nothing. So Antoine, so she may be out just having a good time and she forgot to call home. I mean, what makes you think something bad has happened to her? You don't understand, Inspector. She calls always and she cannot make it for dinner. Let, let alone gone for three days. Uh, not so much as a, uh, hello, I'm safe. Antoine, you know your sister. She has the reputation. She likes to party a lot. We, oui, oui. all. Uh, she doesn't come home sometimes. We all know that. Oui. Look, sooner or later, she'll come to her senses, and she'll come home. Antoine, if I hear anything, I'll call you, all right? So here we have a lady who really knows how to sin and who's gone MIA before. The thing is, if you're a grown-up, it isn't against the law to drop out of sight and get your family all worried. Most of the time, nothing has even gone down. When I was at the Bureau, we only designated maybe 15% of all missing persons cases as involuntary, as in kidnapped or killed. Sometimes people just want to get away from it all, and there's nothing you or the cops can do. A week after Antoine reports his sister missing, a newspaper article grabs his attention. Hello. This could be the answer. A bank teller in Montreal named Alice recently led police to a missing child she'd seen on TV. She claims she can tune into someone's whereabouts if she sees a picture of them. But not everyone in Francine's family is as enthusiastic as Antoine. Psychics are full of merde. What do we have to lose, eh? She found that boy, we? Oui? <laughs> Antoine sends Alice a photograph of Francine, as well as some of her personal belongings. Using these items, Alice tunes into Francine. She comes out of her trance with a cryptic message. This is Alice. Do the letters CRK mean anything to you? Alice, those are the letters on Francie's license plate. How did you know that? I got a vision. I think I can help you find her. Have a good day. Antoine is so impressed with Alice's vision, he buys her a bus ticket to Laurierville. Alice. Antoine. <laughs> Bonjour. It's a pleasure. As an investigator who deals in nothing but the facts, ma'am, I cringe, I mean, I really cringe when these people enter the picture. They're usually in it for the attention and the money. But even I have to admit that Alice doesn't seem like your typical psychic. First of all, she works at a bank, not a strip mall. No crystal balls, no flowing robes, no 1-800 number, and, oh yeah, she doesn't charge for her services. Like I said, she's not your typical psychic. And if it gives you hope, why not? Just beware. Having no luck when they went to where Francine's car was found, Alice's next stop is Robert's Sugar Shack. Austin is leaving us a trail of clues. She's telling me to come here. We must follow the mystic breadcrumbs. For a body. Francine's been brutally murdered. It's an impressive performance, but it's not a surprise because that's what psychics do. They ham it up and explain away anything they're wrong about by saying their, uh, <clears throat> their insights are open to interpretation. 
Alice could be making a calculated guess about what happened to Francine. It's what we call cold reading your audience, and it can be pretty convincing. But guesswork or not, the fact is, Francine's still missing and the family needs answers. And you gotta wonder, is Alice taking them all for a ride, a cruel ride, or could this psychic actually be on the right path? With no evidence of foul play in Francine's disappearance, the police say their hands are tied. But armed with Alice's shocking psychic vision, Antoine tries once again to convince them to investigate. Look, without any evidence, my hands are tied. There may not be any hard evidence, but Alice's visions point to something bad happening. I saw it clear as day, Inspector. Someone has blood on their hands. Uh-huh. These are those uh, magic visions, right? OK. It makes sense, Inspector. That explains why Francine never came home that night. Yeah, so does a few Ryan Gingers. Maybe it was a competitor. You know, Francine has been feuding with that no-good idiot Leblanc over his price fixing. OK, I'll look into it. But, uh, and no disrespect, lady, go easy on the hocus pocus. I must go wherever my visions lead me, Inspector. <sighs> All right, let's hear about those visions. We were in a sugar shack when I had the vision. You can't really blame the cops in a situation like this. I mean, if we treated every hunch, opinion, whim, or especially a psychic vision, as a credible lead, we'd be too busy following up on junk to catch anyone. It's not that we don't feel for the family, we do. It's just that our job is to follow the evidence. When Inspector Boucher looks into the alibi of Francine's rival LeBlanc, it checks out. Chartrand, lui. OK. No, no, c'est tout pour l'instant. Merci beaucoup. He was at the local maple syrup festival. Oh, it's si. good. Inspector Boucher then tries to track Francine's movements through her bank and phone records. He's stymied. With you. Just sober up and come home already. Make my life easier. Francine is so old fashioned, she doesn't have a cell phone and always carries a lot of cash. And there's just no way to keep track of her whereabouts. The next day, determined to solve the mystery, Alice, Antoine, and Robert go back to his sugar shack. I can feel her presence. Is this new? I spilled some syrup the other day. I clean it up. It happens all the time. Francine. She's here. Robert's had enough of Alice and her visions and orders her back to Montreal. Alice reluctantly agrees. But before she leaves, she pays a visit to Antoine. I did want to let you know. I feel like Robert knows more than he's letting on. He has been acting weird ever since you got here. Mm. Like you spooked him when you were drawn to his sugar shack. <laughs> you don't think Robert had anything to... Just keep an eye on him. Oui. So psychic Alice has been sent packing like a crystal ball rubbing busybody, and still no one knows if Francine's fallen victim to anything more serious than a bad hangover. Robert. But Antoine needs to believe that Alice's visions could actually reveal the truth about Francine. She's his only hope. But as they say, hope for the best, plan for the worst. The police have uncovered no leads as to Francine's whereabouts, and the case is stalling. But Francine's brother, Antoine, refuses to give up. The police finally have to admit that she's been gone too long to simply be on a boozing binge. You had to drop a la puck into the game for real. Now, Inspector, something terrible has happened to Francine. Huh? I, I, can, I can feel it. Uh, why would she just take off and let her business go down the tube? Huh? 
<laughs> it don't make no sense. Antoine fills the inspector in on Alice's suspicions about Robert and his own. He hides out in his sugar shack, doing nothing. Doesn't even seem to care that uh, Francine is missing. I'm telling you, Alice is right. Robert, he knows something. A hundred miles away in Montreal, Alice continues to be tormented by the visions of violence. To Alice's surprise, it's Inspector Boucher. He says the case has gone cold, and he'll take any help he can get. I'll be in Lorieville as soon as I can. I have to take me seriously. When I Back in Laurierville, things immediately get heated between Alice and Robert. Somebody important in your life. What is she even doing here? Callez to Sacrama. I had another vision. I think I know what happened to Francine. What? Abduction by aliens? Bigfoot, peut-être? Maybe call Mulder a scully. You see, Inspector? He's acting très bizarre. All right, look, if you want, I'll ask Robert to take a polygraph test, but... You'll have to take one, too. Ben, oui? Inspector, I think I know what happened. All in good time, madame. Roll your eyes if you want, but even if we think they're full of, um, merde, psychics can serve a purpose. They don't solve anything, but if they reassure the family, then they're a useful tool in the investigative toolbox. Why? They keep the family off your back. As Antoine passes his test with flying colors, See. there's no sign of Robert. Polygraphs are another tool in our arsenal. The purpose of a poly isn't just to detect if someone's lying, it's to point out inconsistencies in their story. If someone refuses to outright take one, it looks fishy, but if someone says they'll do it and then backs out, well, that's a huge red flag. And Robert is now on Boucher's radar. Do you know where Robert is? Monsieur Inspector, now may I show you what I saw? That is where you will find Francine's body. Uh, that is the, the lightning tree. It, it's a few miles up the road. It, it was struck by lightning in uh, 95. Alice's drawing is of a place only locals would know about. Even Inspector Boucher has to admit that Alice's latest vision is worth checking out. Alice hasn't quite won over the skeptical investigator, but she's got his attention. More importantly for Boucher, Robert's just shined a light on himself by blowing off a lie detector test. So Boucher comes up with a plan. If he plays Alice and Robert off against each other, maybe Robert will reveal what, if anything, he knows about Francine's disappearance. You were supposed to be at the polygraph. You never showed up. When the inspector questions Robert about why he skipped the polygraph... I, I, I forgot. I, I'm sorry. Can I reschedule? I have things to do today, but um, perhaps later the week, tomorrow... Uh... I'll tell you what, why don't I drive you to the station right now? But instead of going to police headquarters, Inspector Boucher drives Robert out of town and confronts him at the place Alice saw in her vision. The place where she says, They'll find Francine. Keep going. Qu'est-ce que c'est? What is this? Does this look familiar to you? No. I have never seen this place. Lies. Antoine, start digging. No! Stop! Stop! Whatever this place is, it has a dramatic effect on Robert. He breaks down and begs to be taken to police headquarters. I. I have something to tell you. Let's go. Robert, back there you said you had something to say. 
So why don't you start talking? I didn't mean to do anything. It just happened. I panicked. Merde. Take your time, Robert. Robert tells Inspector Boucher that he'd been stealing syrup from Francine for months and selling it on the black market. Remember, maple syrup is liquid gold in this part of the world. Stealing it is kind of like tapping into a whiskey distillery in Scotland. It's a very big deal. Selling to other people! You think I wouldn't notice your feisty foot? Do it, Fini. Fini! You'll never see another dime from me, Cochon. Look, you don't cross someone like Francine. Besides the money, she's gonna banish Robert from the family forever. She'll take everything from him and leave him alone in the gutter, a total disgrace. That'd make anyone snap. Yeah. Ah! Oh no. Mouth. After killing Francine, Robert realized he had to come up with a believable story to explain her disappearance. With Francine's body hidden away, he drives her car to a spot where he knows the police will find it and places himself there to deflect suspicion. Robert didn't intend to murder Francine. It's what we call an impulse kill. But those are not random. There's intense passion, a buildup of anger or jealousy that explodes when someone's reached their limit. And Robert had clearly reached his. I thought you'd never, never suspect. Robert thought he bought himself some time when the police assumed Francine was at the casino, where she spends most Friday nights. But then, that witch shows up. I thought the license plate thing was just a coincidence, but then she saw my, my sugar shack. Here. Even though he assumed all psychics were scam artists, when Alice claimed she knew Francine had been murdered, Robert got scared that somehow she knew he killed her. Oh! Maybe it was a competitor. You know, Francine has been feuding with that no-good idiot. Leblanc. He told Inspector Boucher to look into Francine's competitor as a desperate distraction. When Alice sensed where Robert had hidden Francine in the sugar shack, he panicked and moved the body before they could find it. Robert thought he outmaneuvered Alice, but he still couldn't shake the feeling she could see right through him. He started to crack and the only solution was to get Alice out of the picture. Psychic or no psychic, Robert still has one small problem. Eventually, the cops get wise to the casino story, and then, surprise, Alice is back in town and breathing down his neck. The truth is closing in on him from all sides. I don't know how she knows these things. I don't care. Just keep her away from me. Okay, Robert, you're under arrest. Stand up, please. His plan was to take over Francine's sugar bush until it became clear Francine wouldn't be coming back. Eventually, she'd be declared legally dead, and he'd stand to inherit it and part of the family fortune. I've heard a lot of confessions, but this one's in a class of its own. Most people fess up because they know you've got enough evidence to put them away, and they want to cop a plea deal. Robert, on the other hand, gives it up because he's scared witless. Not of cops, but of a psychic. Oh, that's beautiful. Even Alice didn't see that one coming. Francine's body is recovered near the lightning tree, exactly where Alice said it would be. Am I going to win? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck, I think that. Alice goes back to Montreal, her first murder case wrapped up. She's on her way to a new career as a psychic detective. The word psychic is never mentioned in Inspector Boucher's report. She's simply referred to as a confidential informant. But her involvement helps put Robert away for 30 years. How did she know? How, how did she know? Not something you hear about every day, is it? A psychic tipping the scales in a murder investigation. Cops and clairvoyants, yeah, strange bedfellows. And don't get me wrong, we do not make a habit of reading tea leaves 
But sometimes, just sometimes, you catch a break in a case that's so out of left field, you wonder if there's something more to police work than gathering hard evidence. I mean, we investigators follow our instincts all the time. Is that so different from what a psychic like Alice does? We sweat our suspects, and Alice certainly put a cold sweat on Robert. He just couldn't take it anymore. You might say he got tapped out. I can't explain how she did it. I deal with the law of the land, not the laws of the universe. But whether you're a believer or a skeptic, one thing's for sure, justice will catch up to you one way or another. On this episode of Bizarre Murders, an arson allegedly set by local gangs uncovers the actions of a reclusive anti-drug crusader. She's going around sticking her nose in everyone's business. The heinous plot of a diehard partier. If you want the bottle so badly, go and drink it. A tale of twisted family loyalty and revenge. And one dead body leaves police with the loathsome job of sifting through the ashes, looking for the murderer. Kimmy is a quiet, unassuming 55-year-old woman who recently retired from her job as a dental hygienist. How are we doing? All right. A little drowsy? Yeah. She built herself a nice little nest egg and had plans to spend the rest of her days enjoying her retirement. That was the plan until her house is torched, a gas-fueled inferno that could only be the work of arsonists. So glad she wanted to tell me what's going on here. Listen, you got to do something about this woman. Detective Grant, the responding officer, learns that Kimmy, while quiet, is very protective of her neighborhood. She's going around sticking her nose in everyone's business, and it's okay. just driving us all nuts. She's been on a personal crusade to take down the drug dealers who are taking over her neighborhood. She's even gone as far as installing cameras on her porch to gather evidence against the drug dealers and then sending the tapes to police to shame them into doing something. People were taking notice. So here we have a quiet, middle-aged woman who likes to knit, who's decided to take the law into her own hands. In my experience as a former FBI agent, that is never a good idea. I get it, you want to do something, it's her neighborhood. But when you play with fire, you will get burned. Kimmy's house has been torched at least two times before, luckily without too much damage. But the drug dealer's scare tactics don't deter her. If anything, it fuels her personal fire to clean up her neighborhood. She's the problem here, and you gotta do something about it. While some neighbors see Kimmy as a superhero with her anti-drug crusade. We can't I'll put up with it. this anymore. I'll look into it. Others think she's being reckless endangering the neighborhood further, and that she has to be stopped. And today's top story, local woman being heralded as a hero after her home is burned to the ground in what police suspect is retribution by local drug dealers. The news of Kimmy's heroic fight against the city's drug dealers goes citywide. Neighbors say the woman was leading the fight against drugs and corruption in the community. Throngs of well-wishers send money to cover her medical expenses. A contractor offers to rebuild her house and the governor offers a reward for help with the case. You're making me blush, stop. Overnight, she's gone from zero to hero. When a case is splashed all over the news, it's a double-edged sword. It can be good and it can be bad. The good news is that it can drum up lots of leads and potential suspects. The bad news is it can drum up lots of leads because chasing those leads involves a lot of manpower and most of the leads end up being dead ends. 
But the one thing you can always count on when the media is all over a case, it's going to put a lot of pressure on you to solve the crime, and fast. Hi, Kimmy. Hello. I'm Detective Grant. Oh, nice to meet you. With neighborhood interviews turning up little to no information, Detective Grant arrives at the hospital to question Kimmy. <laughs> You've become quite a sensation. People have been very kind to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, have you had any arguments or disagreements with anyone in your neighborhood recently? Not directly, no. And this was your family home. Mm -hmm. When the investigators interview victims or perpetrators, they're looking as much at how things are being said as what is being said. Is there anything that doesn't quite fit? And Kimmy does not come across as the reserved woman people claim she is. So what could this mean? Is it trauma from the fire? Is she still in shock? Or is there something else going on? Do you think there's anyone else besides drug dealers who might have burned your house down? No. The one question the cops can't shake, if drug dealers wanted Kimmy out of the way for retribution, why would they burn her house down? It's just not their style. Detective Grant reaches out to his informants. Yeah, it's Grant. To size up if they know anything about both the fire and drug dealers who might have had a vendetta against Kimmy. But no one has even heard of her. It makes sense that there are no solid leads coming from the street. I mean, junkies and drug dealers don't get revenge like that. More pokers are needed for this fire. These punks are more gun and knives people. Either way, they wouldn't risk the heat of killing a civilian. I'm no mathematician, but this doesn't add up. Suspecting there's more to this crime than meets the eye, Detective Grant starts digging into Kimmy's personal life. What you doing? Hey, hi, sweetie. How are you? Um, I'm pretty good. Turns out she has a sister. Enough of that. Karen. I'm making your favorite chocolate chip cookies. You're so good. <laughs> who has lived with her for the past 15 years. Hey, you're looking a bit wobbly there. Yeah, I'm good. I'm okay. Good. Yeah. And where Kimmy is reserved and quiet, Karen is a partier with shady friends and is known to make bad decisions. I can see something there. I have a favor to ask. I yeah, have shoot, a date shoot, Luke. tonight. A date? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Maybe you should stop drinking so much before Ooh, the date. No, no, I'm just getting loose. I got a party hardy tonight oh, because I'm okay. going to impress them. The neighbors talk about how close the two sisters are, that they even look alike. So I need to borrow $200 from you. But they also often hear them arguing. <laughs> I just gave you $400. I know, but that was just for living stuff. Especially over money. It's gonna be such a special night, please. Kimmy supports Karen, giving her an allowance. I'm gonna to have to say that the door is closed on the bank today, Kimmy. Which she quickly burns through. Don't look at me that way, please. I've done nothing Come with on. support you. You know this is special and you it need means to so stop much that. to me. You Ooh. need to stop. I'm not gonna fight you over it. You want the bottle so badly? Go and drink. Go on. That's where the money seems oh, to be I can't going anyway. You're doing this! I'm sorry, this is for your own good. How do they look? I don't wear them that often, so I'm going to depend on you. Oh, they look fabulous. OK, and where do you want me to look for just, them? Just straighten the lens and talk to your audience. OK. And go. I don't know who set fire to my house, but I do know that they wanted me dead. Detective Grant returns to the hospital to question Kimmy. It will take a lot more than setting fire to my house four times. And is once again met by a media circus. From the dirty, rotten drug dealers that have infested our streets. Great. Good job. Thank you. So, Kimmy, I understand you have a sister which you conveniently left out the first time we spoke. It must have slipped my mind from the trauma of the fire. Kimmy reveals that Karen left for Atlantic City with her boyfriend a few days before the arson. So Kimmy has a sister, Karen, who looks a lot like her, and this is the first investigators are hearing about it? That is a red flag if I've ever seen one. And there's a second red flag. Where is Karen? Her sister Kimmy's face has been plastered all over the news and not even a phone call to check in. Something does not smell right. Working a hunch, Detective Grant returns to Kimmy's home with the arson team. 
This time, looking for evidence of a crime the fire was meant to cover up. He discovers a freezer, blackened from the fire, and wrapped in what seems to be duct tape. Inside are remains that appear to be human. The fire has melted the freezer seals, letting in the heat and essentially turning the freezer into an oven. Grant's hunch was right. The fire was a cover-up. This case has gone from arson to a murder investigation like that. The question is, whose baked remains are those in the freezer? Yeah, I'm looking for the patient in room 4A. She checked herself out. Against doctor's orders, Kimmy has discharged herself, taking with her several large donation checks she received from her well-wishers. OK, can we toss out the theory that drug dealers were targeting the house? Clearly, something more sinister is going on. Our little miss hero, Kimmy, has some talking to do. What else do I need? <laughs> I'm on a vacation. Kimmy cashes out on some of that sympathy money. In particular, a $2,500 check from a generous donor. <laughs> Find a body, lose a body. This investigation is stalled again. We put out a bolo, or for those not as familiar with police jargon, be on the lookout to track the victim, who may now be a perpetrator, but actually, it's two now. Both sisters are unaccounted for. This is an all-points bulletin, and that's APB. With both Kimmy and Karen missing, the investigation has stalled. But then Detective Grant catches a lucky break. Please, open up. He gets a tip that Kimmy has been seen checking into a motel. Detective Grant, surprised to see you here. Hi, Kimmy. So, uh, what are you doing here? Hey, I'm chilling out and I'm relaxing. It was a tough time in the hospital. Oh, yeah. So I've got a few questions for you. OK. Maybe you come downtown, have a little chat. Again? Yeah. OK, yep. I'll just uh, get my things and, all right, um, OK. Whose body's in your freezer? Oh, detective, I've told you a hundred times already. I don't know whose body is in the freezer. Detective Grant grills Kimmy for hours. Well, where's your sister, Karen? Again, as I've said, she's in Atlantic City. Atlantic City? Yes. Okay. But Kimmy insists that she doesn't know where in Atlantic City Karen is staying and has no way of contacting her. I'll be back. With the interrogation sitting at a stalemate, a surprising document falls into Detective Grant's lap. Turns out, another family member who lives in a different town has filed a missing persons report on Kimmy. What? Because family members haven't seen or heard from her in over a month. I'd like to think that we can get the facts straight as investigators were able to see the forest for the trees. But even I'm confused by this one. The woman sitting in the interrogation room is Kimmy. But now there's a missing persons report for Kimmy. Then who is sitting in that chair in the interrogation room? Yeah, it's Grant. This report, uh, is this for real? When Detective Grant receives the autopsy report, things go from strange to bizarre. The coroner has determined the body in the freezer has been stabbed multiple times, then chopped up with an axe, bagged, and stuffed into the freezer over a month ago. You're sure about this? The coroner also has ID on the body. All right. So 
who are you? Excuse me, I'm Kimmy. I just got off the phone with the coroner. That body in your freezer, that's Kimmy. That can't be. They must have made a mistake. The autopsy report states that the body parts lying in the morgue belong to Kimmy. And yet even when confronted with this evidence, she stands by her story. This situation is particularly strange because you have someone who's been on TV all over the nation, a case the FBI would call a special, a high profile case that can possibly speed up solving the crime. First, Kimmy's the victim of a crime by supposed drug dealers. Then she's reported as missing when she clearly isn't. Now she's supposed to be dead, lying on a slab in the morgue. Is Kimmy really Karen or is Karen really Kimmy? The only way to prove who is who is with fingerprints. But to get a match, whoever Kimmy really is will have to have a criminal record with prints on file. So, you want to tell me what Kimmy was doing in your freezer? Unlike people, fingerprints don't lie. Kimmy's prints match those of a woman arrested for prostitution 10 years earlier. And wait for it, the prints belong to none other than the elusive sister, Karen. Single white female, anyone? Faced with the incontrovertible proof of her identity, the woman claiming to be Kimmy comes clean. All right, I'm Karen. Ah, uh, look at Kimmy baking again. I, I'm making your favorite chocolate chip. Oh, that's really sweet of you. Listen, I've uh, I met this guy. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, yeah, maybe. And uh, I need some money. I'm out of money. Well, Karen, I just gave you 400. Well, that was two days ago, Kimmy. Come on, you know how it is. Oh, I, I'm really tired of this. I, I am. Would you just stop drinking? No, I'm not going to stop drinking. I think I'll have another one. No, no, no. Don't touch me! All I want is some money. Don't you touch me again. I'm not giving you any more money. But there's another twist in store for detectives. They swear to you, on my mother's best china, I did not kill my sister, Kimmy. I don't buy it, Karen. You're the only one who had anything to gain by her death. You gotta come clean. It wasn't me. Detective Grant charges Karen with murder and fraud. It turns out Karen was impersonating her sister Kimmy, and a big part of the reason she was able to get away with it for so long is that the sisters looked a lot alike. But once you've caught a perp red-handed, finding out the rest of the story is just knocking the first domino down. Under mounting pressure in the courtroom and faced with the undeniable evidence against her, Kimmy finally cracks and spills the beans on the entire sordid affair. Kimmy was tired of being Karen's meal ticket, and when she learned her sister had forged her signature to cash four of her annuity checks. What are these? It's no big deal, they're checks. They're just checks. They're checks with my name on them. She threatens to cut her off. It's over. I... What do you mean it's over? I want you out. To the outside world, the look-alike sisters appear close. But in reality, Karen harbors a deep-seated resentment towards Kimmy. After all uh, that I've done? I'm so tired of hearing about everything that you've done for me. You're right. I'm a worthless piece of cow manure. She envies her success and money, and she's not happy with the meager allowance Kimmy gives her. Get out! This is my house, too. When Karen saw her personal ATM closing its door, she came up with a new retirement plan. If Kimmy wasn't going to take care of Karen, then Karen was going to take care of Kimmy. As far as motives go, this is one we see every day, greed. Karen wanted Kimmy's annuities and the fire insurance money. What we don't see every day is someone cutting up their sister, putting the pieces in a freezer, and then setting the house on fire. 
that takes it to the next level. I'm no psychologist, but the word I have for a person who can do that with no remorse is psychopath. Karen had assumed Kimmy's identity, <laughs> allowing her access to her sister's insurance policies, bank accounts, and retirement checks. The media attention and cash donations from well-wishers was a happy bonus. Karen had everyone fooled for the short time she was Kimmy, despite the fact that the lookalike sisters had completely different personalities. And she really was a chameleon, able to change herself into who she needed to be to get what she wanted, and that is, at least until she got caught. In the act of burning the family home for insurance money, Karen herself got burned. Karen is found guilty of murder and fraud-related charges. She's sentenced to life without the chance of parole. In all my years as an investigator, I've seen a lot of truly bizarre cases. But a sister killing her own sister and then impersonating her for money, and then become famous for it? She's a fiery one. She had everyone duped and it was bold, I'll give her that. But that kind of daring doesn't last for long. The law always wins.